Sir Salman Rushdie is an internationally acclaimed novelist and essayist. It was his second novel, Midnight's Children, in 1981 that won him the Booker Prize and propelled him to prominence. Since that time, he's written more than a dozen books. He's received more than two dozen international awards, including a knighthood by Queen Elizabeth in 2007 for what she called his service to literature. It was his fourth novel, The Satanic Verses, in 1988 that drew pro protests in the Muslim world and a fatwa, or death sentence, from the Ayatollah Khomeini. A decade later, that fatwa was rescinded as a precondition to restore diplomatic relations between Britain and Iran. And I remember when um, Salman Rushdie was here before, one of the questions that I asked him was, uh, what did it feel like when the fatwa was issued against you, and then what did it feel like when it was lifted. And I remember his response, he said, bad, then good. Which, <laughs> he is an extraordinarily, his, he has a, a wonderful wit. I, uh, you're really going to enjoy it. In, in May of 2008, he was elected to the American Academy of Arts and Letters. The Times of London ranked him among the top of their list of the 50 greatest British writers since 1945. He is a distinguished writer in residence at Emory University. His latest novel, Luca and the Fire of Life, tells the story of a 12-year-old boy who hungers for adventure. The New York Times praised his exuberant, what they called his exuberant wordplay and his lively interpretations of mythology. Please welcome the masterful storyteller, Sir Salman Rushdie. Thank you. Thanks. Um, yeah, well, I'm going to talk about this book this time, um, since I just wrote it. Um, actually, I wrote it a year ago, so I have to remember what it's about a little bit. Um, and it's a, it, it really, it started as, a, I mean, it's a sort of sequel. It's not exactly a sequel. It's a companion volume more than a sequel to a book I wrote 20 years ago uh, called Harud and the Sea of Stories, which at the time I wrote for my my older son, who was then about 12, 11, 12 years old, and um, and then my now I now have another. Well, actually, he's thirteen now, but he was twelve when I finished the book. A younger son who read the first book and immediately began a campaign uh, to protest about the injustice of not having a book of his own. Um, and I mean, there were basically two answers to that question. One is, kid, life ain't fair. <laughs> you know, just suck it up, you know. And the other was to write the book, so I, I decided to take lots of me. Um, and I had a very good, his advice to me, his literary advice to me, which is profound advice. He said, Dad, don't write books, write series. <laughs> and it's true that if you look at what people his age are reading, they're all reading like volume five of nine of something, you know. And it's taken me 20 years to write volume two in this series, so that's not very commercially sensible, but maybe I'll have to find a way of accelerating. Um, it also reminded me of another piece of advice I had when I was very young as a writer, and I, I just, it was right around the time that I published Midnight's Children, when uh, it was published in England by a great publisher called Tom Mashler, who was the head of Jonathan Cape, which was then Independent Publishing House, now it's part of Random House. And his father, Kurt Marschler, had been also a very eminent publisher in Germany. And then, like many German Jews, had had to escape uh, the rise of Nazism and had come to, come to England, uh, where his son took over the, the mantle of publishing. Anyway, Kurt was a man who had published many of the most sort of eminent, highbrow, egghead writers of Germany. But his real passion was, was writing for younger readers. And, and he, remember, he collared me at a, literally at a Cape Christmas party, kind of like the ancient mariner, you know, came up, sort of grabbed me by the, there was a ship, you know, but, but, but he, but, and what he wanted to say to me in his very heavy Germanic accent was, you must a children's book write. <laughs> and, and at that time, my, my son was only, I mean, he wasn't even two years old. And, and so I said, well, you know, maybe when he grows up a bit, I'll, I'll think about that, but not right now. And he said, no, no. He said, I will tell to you a story. 
And he told me the story about one of his most eminent writers in Germany, um, a writer called Erich Kessner, who he who had published all sorts of you know, works of philosophy and politics and thinking, sort of egghead books. And and Kurt would grab him by the wrist as he grabbed me and say to him, you must take children's book right. You know? and, and eventually to shut him up, Eric Kessner had gone away for a couple of weeks and come, came back with this manuscript and dropped it on his desk. He said, there you are, now you can shut up about it. And, and, and this was a book called Emil and the Detectives. And it became one of the greatest classics of German children's literature. Um, and as Kurt Marshall has said to me, he said, it's the only one of his books that's still in print. <laughs> so, so, uh, so, so there was, it was, that was a lesson that I didn't forget. I mean, it may end up that Harun and the Sea of Stories and this one are the only books of mine that remain in print, and that would be fine, actually. That would be fine. Uh, because I've had probably more fun writing these books than anything else I've written, so I hope that communicates you know, to the readers. But Anyway, Harun and the Sea of Stories was about a boy called Harun whose father was a storyteller uh, called Rashid, um, who at a certain point lost the ability to tell stories, and Harun embarked on this quest to the birthplace of stories, the sea of stories, in order to try and recover his father's storytelling gift. Well, 20 years later, um, we're in the same family, but now there's a younger brother who also, as younger brothers do, wants his own adventure. Um, and this is what happens in this book is, is basically that the father is once again in trouble. I mean, I think boys all essentially think their fathers are pathetic and useless and <laughs> need, need rescuing. Um, and so this book just sort of magnifies that. Uh, what happens in this book is that the father's, literally at this time it's about an existential problem, the problem of life and death, because his father begins to fade, begins to slow down and to lose energy, and eventually falls into um, a deep sleep, which is sort of a coma-like sleep, but is clearly slipping away. And Luca has to, decides that he, he knows because his father, the storyteller, has told him always about this other world, this world of, of magic, um, in which there are magical objects, and one of those is the fire of life, which which could restore his his father's life. But the problem is that to to, to get it involves doing three impossible things. First, it involves getting into the magical world, which you can't. But if you could, then you'd have to steal the fire of life, which nobody ever has. And if you manage to do that, then you'd have to bring it back, which is impossible. So that's, of course, what he sets out to do. Um, I'm just going to read you a few little bits from here and there. I, first, I wanted to, there's a, the book has a, a five line, uh, verse dedication. It's an acrostic, um, poem which uses the five letters of my son Milan's name as the initial letters of each line. And, it goes like this, magic lands lie all around, inside, outside, underground, looking glass worlds still abound. All their tales this truth reveal, naught but love makes magic real. And, and the th reason I read it is, is, is that it, it seems to me to contain the two themes of the book. One is that I do think the book is a kind of love story, uh, not a romantic love story, but a story about the love between parents and children, between fathers and sons. Also, of course, there's mother, very important in this book. Um, and, 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 and the extent to which, you know, how much parents and children will do for each other in the name of that love, how far people will go. And so that's, that's one of the major themes of the book. And, and the other theme is this question of the relationship of the world of imagination, the world of fancy and dreams, and and the real world. What is what is the link between those two worlds? And um, it seems to me that actually the link is quite close. Many things, many of the things in 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 our daily life begin have begun as something that someone dreamed up, and then they become they are actually created in the real world. You know, everything, all inventions begin as dreams, and then and then become real. Anyway. So Luca, this is a bit where Luca is, is, he knows that his father has always told him about the magic. And the point about the world of magic is that like any other world, it has geography. It also has history and probably has biology, but that's probably not for a children's book. Um, anyway, the, the, and this is a, a brief description of it. The, the torrent of words, by the way, 
thunders down from the Sea of Stories into the Lake of Wisdom, whose waters are illumined by the dawn of days and out of which flows the river of time. The Lake of Wisdom, as is well known, stands in the shadow of the Mountain of Knowledge, at whose summit burns the fire of life. This important information regarding the layout and, in fact, the very existence of the magical world was kept hidden for thousands of years, um, guarded by mysterious cloaked spoil sports who called themselves the Alim or Learned Ones. However, the secret was out now. It had been made available to the general public by Rashid Khalifa in many celebrated tales. So everyone in Kahani was fully aware that there was a world of magic existing in parallel with our own non-magic one. And from that reality came white magic, black magic, dreams, nightmares, stories, lies, dragons, fairies, blue-bearded genies, mechanical, mind-reading birds, buried treasure, music, fiction, hope, fear, the gift of eternal life, the angel of death, the angel of love, interruptions, jokes, good ideas, rotten ideas, happy endings, and in fact, almost everything of any interest at all. The Alim, whose idea of knowledge was that it would belong to them and was too precious to be shared with anyone else, probably hated Rashid Khalifa for letting the cat out of the bag. But it is not yet time to speak, as we will eventually have to speak of cats. Not, not, not. <laughs> um, well, what happens is that the first impossible thing Luca manages to achieve, he manages to somehow stumble to the right and find himself in a rather heightened version of his own street where all the colors are brighter and stranger. And in that street, there's a figure which looks exactly like his father, but isn't, which is a kind of translucent mirror image of his father. Um, and quite scary, really. Um, and, and Luca doesn't know who he is or why, why he's there. Um, he says this, this Rashid Khalifa looked exactly like the famous Shah of Blah. He was wearing his Panama hat and his vermilion bush shirt. And when he walked and talked, it became obvious that his voice was Rashid's voice. And the way he moved was an exact copy of the original. But this Rashid Khalifa could be seen through, not clearly, but murkily, as if he were half real and half a trick of the light. As the first whispers of the dawn murmured in the sky above, the figure's transparency became even more obvious. Luca's head began to spin. Had something happened to his father? Was this see-through father some sort of, um, some sort of, are you some sort of ghost? He asked in a weak voice. You are certainly something peculiar and surprising, to say the very least. Am I wearing a white sheet? Do I clank chains? Do I look ghoulish to you? Demanded the phantom dismissively. Am I scary? Okay, don't answer that. The truth is that there are no such things as ghosts or specters, and therefore I am not one. And may I point out that right now I am just as surprised as you? He has two friends, Luca. He has, well, they're animals, actually. One is a dog called Bear, and the other is a bear called Dog. And, and, and they're with him. <laughs> um, they're circus animals, escaped circus animals. Bear's hair was standing on end, and Dog, that's the bear, was shaking his head in a puzzled way, as if he had just begun to remember something. Why are you so surprised, Luca asked, trying to sound confident. You're not the one who can see through me, after all. The see-through Rashid Khalifa came, through, came closer, and Luca had to force himself not to run away. I'm not here for you, he said. So it's unusual for you to have crossed over here when you're in perfect health. And you're dog and bear, too, by the, by the way. The whole thing is exceedingly irregular. The frontier is not supposed to be this easily ignored. What do you mean, Luca demanded. What frontier? Who are you here for? The moment he asked the second question, he knew the answer and it drove the first question out of his mind. Oh, he said. Oh, then, then is my father not yet, said the see-through Rashid. But I'm the patient type. Go away, Luca said. You're not wanted around here, Mr. Mr. What is your name anyway? The see-through Rashid smiled a friendly smile, 
that somehow was not entirely friendly. I, he began to explain in a kindly voice that somehow didn't feel completely kind, I am your father's dad. Don't say that word, Luca shouted. The point I'm trying to make, if I may be allowed to continue, the phantom insisted, is that everyone's dead. Don't say it, Luca yelled. It's different, the phantom said. No two are alike. Each living being is an individual, unlike all others. Their lives have unique and personal beginnings, personal and unique middles, and consequently, at the end, it follows that everyone has their own unique and personal dead. Don't, screamed Luca, and I am your father's, or I will be soon enough. And at that time, you will no longer be able to see through me, because then I will be the real thing, and he, I'm sorry to say, will no longer be at all. Nobody is going to take my father away, Luca cried. Not even you, Mr. Whatever Your Name Is, with your scary tales. Nobody, said the see-through Rashid. Yes, you can call me that. That's who I am. Nobody is going to take your father away. And, and I am the nobody in question. I am, you might say, your nobo-daddy. That's nonsense, said Luca. No, no, the see-through Rashid corrected him. I'm afraid that nonsense is not involved. You will discover that I am a no-nonsense kind of guy. Luca sat on, his, on, the on the street and put his head in his hands. No go, Daddy. He understood what the see-through Rashid was telling him. As his father faded away, the phantom Rashid would go stronger, grow stronger, and in the end there would be only the no this Nobo Daddy and no father at all. But he was very sure of one thing. He was not ready to do without a father. He would never be ready for that. The certainty of this knowledge grew in him and gave him strength. There was only one thing for it, he told himself. This, this, this nobo daddy had to be stopped, and he had to think of a way to stop him. To be fair, said nobo daddy, and in a spirit of full disclosure, I should repeat that you have already achieved something extraordinary, by crossing the line, I mean. So perhaps you're capable of further extraordinary things. Maybe you're even capable of bringing about the thing you are even now dreaming up. Maybe, ha <laughs> ha, you will succeed in bringing about my destruction. An adversary. How enjoyable. How positively darling. I'm so excited. <laughs> Luca looked up. What do you mean exactly crossing the line? He asked. Here, where you are, is not there where you were, explained Nobo Daddy helpfully. This, all of this that you see, is not that which you saw before. This lane is not that lane. This house is not that house. And this daddy, as I have explained, is not that one. If the whole of your world took half a step to the right, then it would bump into this world. If it took half a step to the left, well, let's not go into that just now. Don't you see how much more brightly colored everything is here than it is back home? This, you see, I shouldn't even tell you, really. This is the world of magic. Luca remembered his stumble in the doorway, his brief but intense feeling of giddiness. Was that when he crossed the line? And had he stumbled to the right or, or, or to the left? It must have been the right, mustn't it? So this must be the right-hand path, must it not? And... But was that the best path for him? Shouldn't he, as a left-handed person, have stumbled to the left? He realized that he really had no idea what he was talking about. Why was he on any sort of path at all, and not just in the lane outside his house? Where might such a path lead, and should he even think about going down it? Should he be thinking about just getting away from this alarming Nobo Daddy and finding his way back to the safety of his bedroom? All this talk of magic was much too much for him. Of course, Luca knew all about the world of magic. He had grown up hearing about it from his father every day. And he had believed in it. He had even drawn maps and painted pictures of it. The torrent of words flowing into the lake of wisdom, the mountain of knowledge, the fire of life, all that stuff. But he hadn't believed in it in the way that he believed in dining tables or streets or stomach upsets. It hadn't been real in the, in the way that love was real or unhappiness or, or fear. It was only real in the way that stories were real while you were reading them. 
or heat mirages before you got too close to them, or dreams while you were dreaming. Is this a dream, then, he wondered, and the see-through Rashid, who called himself Nobo Daddy, nodded slowly in a thoughtful way. That would certainly explain the situation, he replied agreeably. So whether it is or not, you know, you have to make up your mind about that. Anyway, they embark on this journey through the magic world to try and find this thing, the, 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 the fire of life. And, um, the magic world seems to have certain characteristics in common with certain kinds of video game. That it has, um, there are lives available everywhere. You, know, you jump on mushrooms and lives appear. And you shake trees and lives fall down. And, um, and the lives are behind bushes and so on. And miraculously, a little counter appears in the top right-hand corner of Lucas' field of vision. And the number of lives he has sort of keeps going up there as he collects them. Um, and there are levels, too. He's got to, he's got to save. There are saving points where he has to save his progress as he goes through. Otherwise, otherwise he has to go back and do it again. Um, and this, I'm just going to read you a little bit from the beginning of this, because like many magic worlds, this magic world has a gatekeeper, and you can't actually get, get into it until you can get past the gatekeeper. And at this point, uh, Luca had, um, he had collected 315 lives, as a matter of fact. Because of the three-digit counter, he could guess that the maximum number he could collect was probably 999. When the old man of the river came up onto the strand with his terminator in his hand, Luca looked around panically for somewhere to hide, and at the same time tried des desperately to remember what his father had told him about the old man, who it seemed was not just one of Rashid Khalifa's inventions after all, or else maybe he was here in the world of magic because Rashid Khalifa had made him up. Luca remembered the way his father told the tale. The old man of the river has a beard like a river. It flows right down to his feet. He stands on the strand with a gun in his hand, the nastiest old man you could meet. And here indeed was that very old man very, uh, with his long white river beard and his enormous blaster coming out onto the riverbank, climbing up onto the strand. And Luca did his very best to summon back the memory of what else the Shah of Blah had told him about this malevolent river demon. Something about asking the old man questions. No. R riddles, that was it. Rashid loved riddles himself. He had tormented Luca with riddles day after day, night after night, year after year, until Luca had become good enough to torment him back. Rashid would sit each evening in his favorite squashy armchair, and Luca would jump onto his lap, even though Saraya, his mother, scolded him, warning that the chair wasn't strong enough to take their combined weight. Luca didn't care. He wanted to sit there, and the chair had never broken, not yet anyway, and all that riddling was about to come in handy after all. Yes, the old man of the river was a riddler. That was what Rashid had said about him. He was addicted to riddling the way gambling, gamblers were addicted to gambling or drunkards to drink, and that was how to beat him. The problem was how to get close enough to the old man to say anything when he had that terminator in his hand and looked determined to shoot on sight. Luca dodged from side to side, but the old man kept coming right at him, and even though first bear the dog and then dog the bear tried to get in the way, a couple of blots blew them to pieces and obliged them to wait until their bodies regrouped. And a moment later, Luca too had been blasted again and had to go through the whole business of flying apart into a million shiny fragments and, um, and, and then uh, joining up again, making those little sucking noises, feeling relieved that losing a life wasn't the same thing as dying. Then it was back to, to life gathering, but this time Luca had made a note of the exact point uh, where the old man came into view. And once he was up to 600 lives, he stopped collecting, positioned himself, and waited. No sooner had the old man's head come into view than Luca yelled at the top of his voice, Riddle me, riddle me, re, which he knew from his evenings with Rashid was the time-honored way of challenging a riddler to a battle. The old man of the river stopped in his tracks, and then a big, nasty smile spread across his face. Who calls me? he said in a cawing cackle of a voice. Who thinks he can outplay the Retzelmeister, the Roi des Enigmes, the Pahelianka Padishah, the Lord of the Riddles? Do you know what you risk? Do you understand the wager? 
The stakes are high. Could not be higher. Look at you. You're nothing. You're a child. I don't even know if I want to face you. No, I won't face you. You are not worthy. Oh, very well, if you insist. And if you lose, child, then all your lives are mine. Do you understand? All your lives are mine. The final termination. Here at the beginning, you will meet your end. And this is what Luca could have said in reply, but did not, preferring to remain silent. And what you don't understand, you horrible old man, is that in the first place, it's my father who is the Riddle King, and he taught me everything he knew. And what you further don't understand is that our riddle battles went on for hours and days and weeks and months and years, and therefore I have a supply of tough brain twisters that will never run out. And what you don't understand most of all is that I've worked out something important, namely that this world I'm in, this world of magic is not just any old magical world, but the one my father created. And because this is his magic world, and nobody else's, I know secrets about everything in it, including, oh terrible old man, about you. What he actually said aloud was this, and if you lose, old man, then you will have to terminate yourself, not just temporarily, but once and for all. How the old man laughed. He guffawed until he wept, not only from his eyes, but through his nose as well. He held his sides and leapt from side to side, and his long white beard cracked in the air like a whip. That's a good one, he said, finally panting for breath. If I lose, that's priceless. Let's begin. But Luca wasn't going to be fooled that easily. Riddlers are tricksters, he knew that much. And you had to nail down the deal before you began the battle, or they would try to wriggle out of it later on. If you lose, you will do as I have said, he insisted. The old man of the river made a peevish face. Yes, 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 he replied. If I lose, I will self-terminate. Auto-terminate. Termination of me by me will occur. He, 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 I'll blast myself to bits. Permanently, Luca said firmly, once and for all. The old man grew serious and his face colored unpleasantly. Very well, he barked. Permanent termination, if I lose. In a word, termination. But as you are about to discover, child, I'm not the one who is about to lose all his lives. Bear and dog were in a state of high agitation, but now Luca and the old man were circling each other, staring each other down, and it was the old man who spoke first, in a hard, greedy voice, pushing roughly through teeth that seemed hungry to eat up little Luca's life. What goes around and around the wood, but never goes into it? The bark of the tree, said Luca at once, and shot back. It stands on one leg with its heart in its head. Cabbage, snapped the old man. What is it that you can keep after giving it to someone else? Your word. I have a little house and I live in it alone. It has no doors or windows and to go out I must break through the wall. Egg. What do you call a fish without an eye? A fish. What do sea monsters eat? Fish and ships. Why was six afraid of seven? Because seven ate nine. <laughs> what has been there for millions of years but is never more than a month old? The moon, when you don't know what it is, then it's something, but when you know what it is, then it's nothing. That's easy, Luca said, badly out of breath. A riddle. They had been circling faster and faster, and the riddles had been coming at greater and greater speed. This was just the beginning, Luca knew. Soon the number riddles would start, and the story riddles. The difficult stuff still lay ahead. He wasn't sure if he could last the course. So the thing was not to let the old man dictate the pace and manner of the contest. It was time to play the joker in the pack. He stopped circling and put on his grimmest expression. What, he asked, goes on four legs in the morning, two legs at noon, and three legs in the evening? The old man of the river stopped circling too, and for the first time there was a weakness in his voice and a tremble in his limbs. What are you playing at, he demanded feebly. That's the most famous riddle in the world. Yes, it is, said Luca, but you're stalling for time. Answer me. 
four legs, two legs, three legs, said the old man of the river. Everyone knows this one. Ha! Huh, it's the oldest one in the book. The she-monster known as the Sphinx, Rashid Khalifa used to tell Luca, sat outside the city of Thebes and challenged all the travelers who passed by to solve her riddle. When they failed, she killed them. Then one day, a hero came by and knew the answer. And what did the Sphinx do then? Luca asked his father. She destroyed herself, Rashid replied. And what was the answer to the riddle? Luca said. But Rashid Khalifa had to admit that no matter how many times he learned the blasted story, he could never remember the solution to the riddle. So that old Sphinx, he said, not very sadly, she'd have eaten me up for sure. Come on, Luca said to the old man of the river, your time's up. The old man of the river looked around in panic. I could just blast you anyway, he said. Luca shook his head. You know you can't do that, he said. Not now, not anymore. Then Luca allowed his expression to become a little dreamy. My father could never remember the answer either, he said. And this is my father's world of magic, and you are his riddle man. So you can't know what he couldn't recall. And now you and the Sphinx must share the same fate. Permination, the old man of the river said softly. Yes, that is just. And without more ado, and quite unsentimentally, he lifted his terminator, set the dial on maximum, pointed the weapon at himself, and fired. The answer is a man, Lucas said to the empty air, as the tiny, shining smithereens of the old man blew away into nothingness who crawls on all fours as a baby, walks upright as a grown-up, and uses a stick when he's old. That's the answer. A man. Everyone knows that. So, off they go. I'm going to read just one more bit. Um, as they get closer to the heart of magic, they discover that many of the inhabitants of the, of the heart of magic are former divinities, gods that people used to once believe in and now don't, discarded gods from all the great religious traditions of the world, Greek gods, the Roman gods, the Egyptian gods, the Assyrian gods, the gods of everywhere, who are now ungods, sad fate. Uh, awful, imagine it, you were, once you were a god, now you're nothing, tragic. And there they all are, in the heart of magic. Um, to which Luca is traveling with his friends, Dog and Bear and Nogo Daddy, and he's also a quiet friend, uh, who's actually the heroine of the book, I haven't got time to read a bit about her, um, who is the sultana of, of a land called Art, stands for over the top. Um, <laughs> and um, she, she's rather outspoken and quite often rude to people, and so she's known not as the sultana, but as the insultana. <laughs> and, um, she has a flying carpet, useful. She has, in fact, a flying carpet given to her by Solomon, King Solomon, which can change size in order to accommodate more and more people if it needs to. And um, actually, there is one of the things that's available in the literature of flight, that you would be interested to know, there actually is a, a serious literature about flying carpets. And, and there is a legend that King Solomon had such a carpet. So there we are, she's got it now. And they're flying towards the center of the world of magic through it. And Luca looked down, saw below him the river of time flowing from the distant and invisible lake of wisdom at the heart of the heart of magic, which was still too far away to be seen. The river flowing into and then out of the immense circle of the circular sea, at the bottom of which he knew slept the giant worm bottom feeder who coiled his body all the way around the circle just so that his head could nibble at his tail. Outside the circle directly, beneath the flying carpet at that moment were the vast territories of the badly behaved gods, the gods in whom nobody believed anymore, except as stories that people once liked to tell. They don't have any power in the real world anymore, Rashid Khalifa used to say, sitting in his favorite squashy armchair with Luca curled on his lap. So there they all are in the heart of magic, the ancient gods of the north, the gods of Greece and Rome, the South American gods and the gods of Sumeria and Egypt long ago. They spend their time, their infinite timeless time, 
pretending they are still divine, playing all their old games, fighting their ancient wars over and over again, and trying to forget that nobody really cares about them anymore, or even remembers their names. That's pretty sad, Luca told his father. To be honest with you, the heart of magic sounds like a lot like an old folks home for washed up superheroes. <laughs> Don't let them hear you say that, Rashid Khalifa replied, because they all look gorgeous and youthful and, 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 and luminous and well perfect. Being divine or even ex-divine has its perks. And inside the magic world, they still have the use of their superpowers. It's in the real world that their thunderbolts and enchantments no longer have any effect. Must be awful for them, Luca said, to have been worshipped and adored for so long, and then just discarded like last year's unfashionable clothes. Particularly for the Aztec deities from Mexico, Rashid said, putting on his scary voice, because they were used to receiving human sacrifices. The throats of living people were cut and their lifeblood flowed into the gods' stone goblets. Now there's no blood for those disused gods to drink. You've heard of vampires? Most of them are bloodthirsty, long-in-the-tooth, undead Aztec gods. <laughs> What's more, said he, they all behaved extremely badly. This got Luca's attention. The notion of gods behaving badly was an odd one. Weren't gods supposed to set an example uh, to the people whose gods they were? Not in the olden days, Rashid said. These olden and now jobless gods usually behaved as badly as people, or actually much worse, because being gods, they could behave badly on a bigger scale. They were selfish, rude, meddlesome, vain, bitchy, violent, spiteful, lustful, gluttonous, greedy, lazy, dishonest, tricky, and stupid. And all of it exaggerated to the maximum because they had those superpowers. When they were greedy, they could swallow a city. When they were angry, they could drown the world. When they meddled in human lives, they broke hearts, stole women, and started wars. When they were lazy, they slept for a thousand years. And when they played their little tricks, other people suffered and died. Sometimes a god would even kill another god by knowing his weak spot and going for it the way a wolf goes for the throat of its prey. Maybe it's a good thing they faded away, Luca said, but it must make the heart of magic a peculiar sort of place. Nowhere more peculiar in the universe, Rashid replied. And, and what about the gods people still believe in, Luca asked. Are they in the heart of magic as well? Oh, dear me, no, said Rashid Khalifa. They're all still right here with us. <laughs> so, I'm going to stop there. All right, thank you. Um, do you have because you write almost like telling the story of a video game mm. do you fear storytelling is losing to video games huh, maybe I mean I don't know I, I feel you know the death of literature has been forecast almost since the birth of literature you know Everything was supposed to kill stories, you know, um, television, movies, everything was supposed to kill stories, and then radio even before that, you know, and somehow nothing did. So I think it's a, it's a resilient form, but I, I do think that one of, the, one of the themes of this book is that, I mean, on the one hand, it's quite fond of video games, this book, you know, it's quite positive about, the, about the, the playful, it plays with them as, an, as a kind of metaphor of quest. This is a quest book, and many video games are quest narratives as well. Um, but on the other hand, it does try and say that there's something else, there's an older thing, which is, which is story, which is, which is very important uh, to protect and nurture. Uh, because Nobodaddy, at one point, actually, says to, uh, her, says to Luca that man alone is the storytelling animal. That, you know, there's nothing else on the earth that does this curious thing of telling itself stories in order to work out what kind of thing it is. He says, he says at one point, do, do, do porpoises have narrative purposes? No. Do, 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 do elephants elephanticize? You know, um, they do not. He says, man alone burns with books. And, and this is the thing, I think, that, that it is something, I mean, the serious, one of the serious things under this book is this idea that that the, the telling of stories is 
profoundly connected with our nature as, as human beings, with the nature of the species. And when, we are, when we come into the world, the thing we ask for almost immediately after sustenance, after food, what we want is somebody to sing to us or somebody to tell us a story. And, um, and so these things are close, to, very close to the heart of human nature. And, and that's why it seems to me they need to be nurtured and, and, and we people, children need to be reminded perhaps that they are essential. Um, I mean, I think for that reason they will survive because, because they are so close to our instinctive nature as human beings, you know, that, that, that it's difficult to get rid of them because, you know, Stephen Pinker talks, famously talked about language being an instinct and he believed that, you know, the reason why we can acquire language so easily uh, when it's such a complicated thing to acquire, is because we have a language instinct built into our DNA, and I'm, I'm have begun to feel that we maybe have a story instinct too. That we have we have a built into the structure of you know in, into the DNA. There is a a need for story, and I think that means maybe will survive even may even survive the onslaught of Super Mario and Call of Duty Modern Warfare Two, and um, and, and you know Red Dead Redemption. And, and uh, you know, all of that. Grand Theft Auto, God help us. Um, how long did it take you to write the book, and what was your typical day when you were writing it? This book? Yes. Um, well, actually, the longest, the longest part was, uh, was uh, just working out the narrative. I, it, very strange. When I was writing Harun and the Sea of Stories 20 years ago, it was one of those occasions when the storyline sort of plopped into my head, more or less, right away. So actually I knew what the story was. And, and the problem of that book was finding the language to write it in. And, and I had a, a, a long struggle to find that. How do you write a book which is, not, which, is, which is available to both adults and children, not too grown up for children, not too childish for adults? And this time around, I had the opposite problem because I felt I knew how to write the book because I'd actually solved that problem the previous time. So I knew the tone of voice, the language, the form. But this time, it took me a long time to work out the story. So it took me, I mean, very roughly speaking, took me about a year to work out the story and about, and, and then sort of about a year to write it. Um, I finished it a year ago when I gave it to my son actually for his 12th birthday. And, and he was the first reader. It was very satisfying. I had agents and publishers calling me up saying, well, when, why, why haven't we got the manuscript? And I said, well, because, you know, Milan's reading it and he hasn't finished yet. <laughs> and, and, and they said, well, why hasn't he finished yet? You know, and I said, well, he's got chemistry homework, you know. <laughs> so, so maybe he'll read it at the weekend. And it was wonderful. It, there'd be all these people sort of frustrated at the, and sort of disbelieving at the idea that they couldn't read the book, but they couldn't. He had to, I had to get his thumbs up, you know, before it could go on its way. And fortunately, I did get it. Uh, I think both he and I were quite relieved. You know? I mean, I think because obviously I wanted him to like it, but also I think he wanted him to like it. You know, it would have been, it would imagine his problem of reading the book that his dad wrote for him and not liking it much. You know? um, so I think both of us were extremely relieved when it turned out that he did like it. Well, that actually is my question, is how Milan reacted to the story. Well, he did. No, he reacted, you know, I think he, as I say, he's now reading it again, because he read it in, in manuscript, um, typescript, and now he's reading it now that there's an actual book to read. And I think he's enjoying it more this time because he knows that he likes it, and because he knows that he doesn't have to tell his dad you know, any bad news. So, so he's enjoying it more this time. But no, he really did, he liked it a lot and, and was helpful, actually. Um, for instance, that character, the, 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 the character of, of, of death, you know, Nobu Daddy, who's in the book, is, I, I was worried about that character that I thought it might be too frightening. You know, I thought it might be, I mean, children like to be scared, but they don't like to be freaked out. They don't like to be, you know, they don't like to be disturbed. And I, I wasn't sure whether I'd cross that line or not, you know. So, so I gave him the first couple of chapters to read, and, and I didn't tell him anything. I just said, you just read that, tell me what you think. And to my enormous relief, not only did he think they were okay as chapters, but that, that he said that without prompting, he said that that was his favorite character. And I thought, oh, I see. This child has a little darkness in him. <laughs> and and I, thought, I thought I could push it a bit then, you know, so it was an encouragement. Very helpful, very helpful criticism. They both actually, when I wrote Harun and the Sea of Stories, I again showed 
first few chapters to my then young son, Zafar. And said, I said, what, did, what do you think? And he said, yeah, you know, I liked him, Dad. I said, oh, well, that's good. He said, uh, he said you know, some people might be bored. <laughs> I said, I said, you know, not me, of course. I mean, I'd read it, but some, some people. I said, what do you mean, bored? <laughs> he said, why? Why would some people be bored? And he gave me this amazing piece of criticism. He said, well, it doesn't have enough jump in it. I said, jump? He said, yeah, yeah, it does, doesn't have enough jump. And I thought, you know, I knew exactly what he was talking about. And I said, you know, I can do jump. And I said, give me that back. <laughs> I took it back, went away and, and rewrote it and gave it to him again. And I said, and, you know, now through clenched teeth, I said, you know, what do you think of it this time? <laughs> and he said, no, now it's fine, Dad. So, <laughs> and it was actually just the best literary criticism I ever had in my life. Um, and so this time I made sure that there was jump. Um, one of the things that it's very obvious, it was obvious to me uh, in, in planning this book, is that the story of the quest for fire is one of the few stories that is really universal to all cultures. I mean, every single culture that you ever, that you look at, whether it's Korean, Hindu, Muslim, Chinese, Native American, South American, wherever you look, every single culture has a story about the theft of fire. Uh, and, I, and it's because, I suppose, the arrival of fire in the lives of human beings was a transformation in the kind of lives that human beings were able to lead. And it was one of the big steps towards becoming the kind of species that we now are, the arrival of the, 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 the possession of fire, the thing that in the Greek myth Prometheus steals for human beings, that in the Native American myths often animals steal it, but the coyote that's in this, but there's a coyote, and there's a kind of wily coyote in this book, um, who, who, who is one of the fire thieves. And that's a Native American myth that, 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 that happened. But literally everywhere you look in the world, you can see that the subject fire and its acquisition by human beings is one of the, maybe the oldest story, maybe the oldest story, maybe older than the invention of the sky god. You know, um, the, 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 the quest for fire is, is an, the most ancient of tales. Um, and, and of course, it, it's, a, it's not just about fire. Fire is also life, fire is creativity, fire is all sorts of things. Um, and that's where I think you may, your question may be answered because. Thank you very much. Because, because the subject of fire is not just about stuff that lights, makes wood burn. You know, it's, it's about the thing that makes human beings who they are. The thing that burns within us. There's a character in this book, a small character, actually physically very small character, called a fire bug, who is very indignant at the bad rap that fire gets compared to water. <laughs> People think of water as nice. He says, you know, water can flood the world. Nobody blames water. Fire burns down a house. Everybody says fire is a terrible thing. You know? And he is particularly incensed by the idea that people think that life comes from water, that there's a fountain of life. He says, you know, life is not a drip. Life is a flame. Um, and, and that's, I think, that at the heart of almost every single one of the fire myths of the human race, that life is a flame, you know, and, and, uh, uh, and that it can go out or it can be nurtured. You know, and and it, was, it was actually an extraordinary piece of learning for me to see how universal this story is and how it means the same thing in every culture. You know, people, when people tell the story of the quest for fire, they're always telling the same story. Um, and in every language, in every part of the world. So... This is a way of, you know, trying to renew that story, if you like, for, for now. Let's just if you think about Greek mythology for a minute. One of the things that, that the Greeks did with these extraordinary stories was to compress an enormous amount of meaning into a very small space. You know, if you think about it, when I wrote my novel, The Ground Beneath Her Feet, um, uh, uh, that grew out of, in a way, the, the Orpheus myth. And if you think about the story of Orpheus and Eurydice, you can actually tell that story in less than 100 words. You know, um, it, it's a, it doesn't even require a page to tell that story. Um, and yet, the amount of meaning contained in that 
in those few hundred words, and then in those few in those few words, is is colossal. And and what I felt in that story when I was writing that book is that there's a at the heart of it there's this triangular relationship between art, love, and death, and it asks you questions about those three things and their relationship, which can be changed, whose meaning changes as you turn the triangle. You know, so you could say that it's a story about how art, the music of Orpheus, driven by love, his love for, for Eurydice, overcomes death um, and allows him to actually enter the world of the dead. You know, an impossible thing. Or, if you want to be more tragic about it, you can say that it's a story about how death, in spite of art, in spite of love, overcomes art. Eurydice is not rescued by Orpheus. No. Um, and so, yes, these, these, all these stories contain very big problems, many of which could be called impossible, rescuing somebody from beyond the grave, you know, the quest for the golden fleece. Um, you know, all, all of these things are, uh, you know, the, the, the escape from the maze of the Minotaur. Um, you know, many, many, many of the Greek myths ask the hero to do something that can't be done. Um, I mean, the, 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 the labors of Hercules, they're, they're, all, they're all like that. Um, but doing the impossible is the thing that human beings set out to do over and over again. You know, and, and, uh, and it's surprising how often they manage to do it. You know, uh, it, there used to be a saying in the English language that it would, that it was as unlikely that such, a, that such and such would happen as that a man would walk on the moon. <laughs> um, and, uh, that happened. You know, um, so, we're good at doing the impossible, you know. Um, I mean, half the things that we now take for granted would a hundred years ago have struck our ancestors as being breathtakingly impossible. Airplanes, telephones, television, you know, to say nothing of movies, computers, etc. you know. The fact that you can walk down a street with a thing in your hand which allows you to speak to anyone in the world. You know, um, it's these are impossible things. These are things that you know only two or three generations ago people would have seen as impossible things, and now we think of them as banal. You know, and we complain about our BlackBerry or our iPhone that it's so goddamn slow. You know, <laughs> why doesn't it make the connection faster without realizing that it's doing something unbelievable, unbelievable? That even you know my father shown. A phone, a cell, a cordless phone, would not have been able to believe that it could work. You know, um, so it's what we do for a living. The human race, we do impossible things. Sometimes we do impossibly horrible things. Um, that too. In Rugby Chapel, where I had to go several, much too often, <laughs> there was there was a very beautiful little memorial uh, to Lewis Carroll, marble, a marble stone in which they had, somebody had with great skill carved the silhouettes of the Tenniel characters into marble. And so there, was, there would be a black silhouette set in a square of white marble and then a white silhouette of black marble going around the edge. And I thought, you know, I'm going to the same school as the man who wrote Alice in Wonderland. And, and that's fine. That'll do. And one of the things I thought when writing this book, I thought about Lewis Carroll because... Um, one of the things that I thought, I thought, what must it have been like to try to write a second Alice book? You know, um, Alice, Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, when it came out, was oddly not that well received. It got quite a lot of bad reviews. The drawings were very well received. Um, the text, not so much. And in fact, there was at least one review which asked why this great illustrator, John Tenniel, was wasting his time on this nonsense. You know, um, and that was very rapidly undone by the book's popularity with the reading public. You know, and within five or six years, it was a very well-established, very, very beloved book, you know, as it has remained, of course. And it was about seven years after writing the first book that he thought to write a second one. He had a much bigger problem than I did, because two things had happened. First of all, Alice had grown up. I mean, the real Alice, Alice Pleasance Little, had grown up. 
And secondly, he had become estranged from the family and he wasn't really in touch with her. You know, so, so he's not, I mean, I had the benefit of being able to write for an actual child who actually was there and was a child and with whom I was in close touch because he was my son. Um, Lewis Carroll had to write through the looking glass um, out of the memory of Alice, you know, rather than out of an actual person who was still around. And, and I've always thought there's these lines, he has this acrostic verse much longer than my five lines, um, a long verse of her entire name, Alice Pleasance Little, with, 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 a, with each line beginning with one letter of her name, um, divided into three line verses. And in the middle, the lines which begin with the S, A, and N of Pleasance are just some of the greatest lines in English poetry. He, said, he says, Still she haunts me phantom wise, Alice moving under skies never seen by waking eyes. And I thought that's what you know, she haunted him. Um, and he wrote out of, the, out of that haunting, you know. And the second book is an unbelievable book. You know, I mean, it, it really, again, and I thought to learn from it that what he did not do, the big mistake, would have been to return to Wonderland. You know, and, and instead, he w didn't go back there. He found a completely different imaginative world for Alice to enter. Um, and I thought I should try to do that too. You know, don't go back where you've been. Go somewhere new, you know. And I mean, I'm a big, I mean, obsessive about Lewis Carroll. You know, I could, uh, there are, I, I have been known, if asked, to recite the whole of The Walrus of the Carpenter. And sometimes, sometimes actually, if, if, even if not asked, uh, I, could, uh, or I could recite the whole of Jabberwocky um, and so on. So, yeah, I'm, it's very much, I mean, I think those two, and I think also about the two Alice books, that they are exactly this, that thing, which is a book, which are books which are, in a way, very sophisticated books, you know, containing ideas, profound philosophical ideas, but turned into this kind of antic nonsense, you know. But if you read it like a grown-up and you are asked to ponder the question of the difference between saying what you mean and meaning what you say, you know, that's actually quite a profound question. You know, um, when Humpty Dumpty says, when I use a word, it means what I want it to mean, neither more nor less, you know, he's defining most politicians. <laughs> <laughs> and so there's, there's a lot in those books which is adult, a lot. You know, and, and, and yet children read them with absolute joy and ease. You know, and I thought, if you can do half of that, that's good. You want me to recite the whole of the war, Russell? No, yeah. I won't. Yeah. <laughs> All right, thanks, yeah. Authors fall into one, or, one of two camps. They either fall in love with dictionaries or they fall in love with mythology. And I just thought that was a huge insult to you because you seem to have fallen in love with both. And I was wondering if you can remember the time in your life when, you know, that light went off for you, when myths and dictionaries and the whole language huh. sort of opened up. Yeah, I don't, I don't see, I'm not sure that that's a real choice, actually. And I don't think it is, because I think if you, I mean, you know, if you, if you think about, like, Joyce, you know, nobody's more in love with, with language than Joyce, and yet his entire book is based on the myth of Odysseus. You know, so it's a, I think it's not an either-or question. I mean, I think it's true about Nabokov that he fell in love with the dictionary, not mythology. It's true about him. Um, but so what? <laughs> um, I, you know, I always thought that it was a great good fortune for me to grow up as an Indian child surrounded by the storehouse of story that, that, that surrounds you, engulfs you um, as an Indian child, of which I guess the stories that are best known in in, in America would be the, the would be some of the Arabian Nights stories, you know, but but uh, but but there's there's many many more than that. I mean, in fact, the, the title of Harun and the Sea of Stories came from was taken from a, a compendium of fantastic tales um, written in Sanskrit in Kashmir, whose whose title was the Ocean of the Streams of Story, Katha Sarit Sagar, uh, Katha means story, Sagar, ocean. Sarit streams, you know, um, the story stream ocean. And I thought, well, I just, all I did was take the title literally. I thought, suppose, because in that, in the, in the case of the, of the, of the Katha Sarit Sagar, there isn't, in fact, an ocean in it. It's just a title for a story compendium of many, many stories. But I thought, supposing there was an ocean, 
You know, supposing there was a place where the stories came from, the ocean of the streams of story, where all the stories were there flowing together amongst each other as streams. And so amazing what you can do by taking things literally. Uh, um, and so, yeah, I think a lot of the kind of writer that I became uh, came out of having been born into that tradition, you know. And one of the reasons I always wanted a flying carpet in a book, finally made it, um, is that the thing you learn, if that's your tradition, the tradition of the, fa of the fantastic tale, you know, the thing you learn very early on is that stories are not true, that these things did not happen, these people did not exist, and those, these events did not occur. No matter how convincing they may be or how beautiful, they are not true. And that therefore, Madame Bovary, Anna Karenina are untrue in the same way as a flying carpet is untrue. Not in a different way, in the same way. There was no such person as Emma Bovary or Anna Karenina, and she did not do those things. So once you know that, it's, that fiction is fictional, you know, once, you, once you are made aware of the fictiveness of fiction, it releases you. Then you do anything. You know? <laughs> um, because it's all untrue. And the only thing that matters is if you could, through that, arrive at some kind of felt truth, some kind of human truth about how human beings, how we are with each other and how we think and feel and act and so on. That's the truth you want from fiction. You don't want photographic truth. You know, you, you want this other truth. And that's true, for instance, you could, if I use an analogy with painting, Van Gogh's painting of a starry night is not what a starry night looks like. If you were to take a photograph of a starry night, it would not look like that. And yet, it's an extremely good painting of a starry night. Um, and I think, you know, the difference between painting and photography is something like the difference I'm talking about, you know. Um, I mean, often my, I get, I was told that my work had something to do with South American magic realism. Um, but the truth is that what happened in about the 20s and 30s of the 20th century is that there was an extremely good translation of the Arabian Nights published in Latin America in Spanish. And that was colossally influential on the literature of South America. And so magic realism, South American magic realism also comes from this story tradition. You know, both drinking from the same sea, which is the sea of stories. I just finished Midnight's Children, and I enjoyed it very much. Thank you. Um, and I read somewhere where it's in the process of being filmed in India, and I yep. was just wondering if that's true and how that was going. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's, it's not, we're not shooting yet, but, uh, but we are close. You know? I mean, I think we've, it's being, I wrote the screenplay. Um, I now, I've had a very fast course in, in the world of making movies, and how much bullshit you have to get to go through, you know, <laughs> who you have to lie to, and so on. You know, there's a, it's just, you forget about it. Um, but we, we now have uh, what is called in the trade a locked script. A locked script means you're not supposed to make any changes to it, and so, of course, you make changes to it every day. Um, and well, we basically have a script, and we're, and we're quite a long way down the road of casting it. And, um, and we have, we're quite a way, long way down the road of getting the money. Uh, but we haven't quite finished casting it. We don't quite have the money. I would think that we will um, get it, and I would hope that this time next year we would have we, we would have, we would have shot it. I mean, that's the plan is to shoot it next year. Uh, exactly when and where and for how much and so on. That's all still there. Still some question marks there. But it's going to be directed by a wonderful film director. The, um, Indian Canadian film director Deepa Mehta, who, who made uh, the film Water, that was nominated for an Academy Award a couple of years ago. Earth, Fire, you know, that trilogy that she made. Um, anyway, wonderful, lyrical, almost visionary film director, and so I'm very happy that she's doing it. And we've been working very closely together on it, and, you know, so far so good. But, you know, we haven't shot, haven't shot a foot of film yet, so we can still screw it up. Yeah. <laughs> Hmm? Oh, what language? No, I mean, it'll be a mixture. It'll be a mixture. Um, English, Hindi, one or two other languages. You know. I mean, I think one of, I have to say, I do not like Slumdog Millionaire very much, but one of the things that it did demonstrate to the American movie distribution circuit 
is that you could have a film involving lots of subtitles and people don't care. You know, that, they, that if the film's interesting, they'll go, they'll go see the movie. You know? So it allows us to make the film in the languages that people would speak. You know? And, and uh, I think that's, that's right, that we should do that. Yeah. Hello. I'd like to ask you to reflect on your, on your body of work and, um, and to ask you specifically if, um, if you feel that the relationship between the actual and the impossible has changed over time and over the course of, of your books. Gosh. I don't know. I don't know. It sounds like a PhD thesis to me. <laughs> it's, you know, it, it's, it sounds like you should write that. <laughs> um, it's, it's, it's very difficult. I don't actually spend very much time trying to sort of understand my body of work because, because you know, I'm still making it. Um, and I'm, I'm more interested in the next thing, really. You know, I think that's a characteristic of people in, in any art form. You know, when you finish a piece of work, it becomes almost uninteresting. You know, it, what's interesting is the next thing. And so I'm, I'm going that way, you know. I'm, I'm, I don't spend a lot of my life looking at that. Um, but, I mean, things do change, you know, I mean, when I was, well, first of all, it's been a long time, you know, I mean, the first book, first, my first book was published in 1975, so that's, that's, that's 35 years, it would be surprising if nothing changed, you know, if I was still the person I was at the age of 28, I mean, God help me, you know, um, when I started out, I thought, when I was writing Midnight's Children and Shame, and, and, and the satanic verses, I, I thought that what I was trying to do was to make some kind of reckoning with the various elements that I felt had gone to make me the person that I was. You know? and, and, and those were, in the first place, India, in the second place, Pakistan, and in the third place, the act of migration uh, to, the, to, to the West. And, and that's essentially what those three books are about. You know, they're about India, Pakistan, and migrants. Um, and I know that, that, that people thought the Satanic Verses was about something else, but actually a relatively small part of it has anything to do with that. The great bulk of that novel is about, is about what it's like to come from one culture into another and try and make a life in another world. Um, there's a certain point, I think, in many writers' lives when you feel that you've finished doing the thing that you started out trying to do. And, and certainly after I wrote Satanic Verses, that, that, I mean, not, and not because of any of the, of the problems, but just because, you know, artistically, I felt that I'd actually finished that job. And, and so then, you know, now what? And, and I came to feel, and still feel a lot of the time, that the, the accidents of my life, because I've sort of traveled around so much and lived in different places and, you know, seen the world from different angles, you know, I just felt it gave me the possibility of having as a subject something which I think is very interesting to everybody right now, which is how this shrinking world of ours joins up and how actions in one part of the world influence things that happen in another part of the world. You know, and, and uh, literature didn't need to do that once upon a time. You know, when Jane Austen was writing, she could neglect the Napoleonic Wars, you know, even though they were exactly contemporary with, with her as a writer. I think Pride and Prejudice was written in 1812. Uh, and, and yet, th the public life and the way in which her country was engaged with other countries didn't need to be part of her subject because her characters' lives were so little affected by that that she could you know, fully explore the lives of those characters without looking at those, those collisions. Those, you know, uh, I mean, the British Empire at its peak, is contemporary with the work of Charles Dickens. Um, and yet, almost nothing of the British Empire get, finds its way. In, in, at, at the time when England was the most powerful country in the world, you know, when it was ruling a quarter of the planet, the greatest writer at, the, at that time of England's preeminence ignored it. Ignored it. Wasn't interesting. You know? uh, because the lives of the people he wanted to write about were so little affected by that. Um, now the world isn't like that. You know, now you sneeze in Japan and you feel the breeze in California. You know, and that kind of world of the butterfly effect. You know, 
Um, I think we have to, as writers, recognize that. Recognize that, you know, to put it at its most brutal, when those planes flew into those buildings in New York, the story of the Arab world became the story of New York City. And you couldn't understand the story of New York City without understanding that other narrative. You know, and um, we no longer live in little boxes. You know, all the little boxes open up into all the other little boxes. Um, and the question is how to tell that story. You know, and, and I, I felt that because I've lived in a lot of little boxes around the place, that I have some knowledge of how they open into each other, that, that, that that's given me, if you like, the second act um, of a subject. And it's a subject which I think, you know, we're all thinking about now. So, so that's fortunate. It's fortunate to have had this kind of life and therefore to get that kind of subject. But that's as much as I can do on my oeuvre, you know. Um, <laughs> And uh, uh, I, I literally have, I have no idea if that will have anything to do with whatever novel I might write next. You know, because I know a number of writers who've tr be, made the mistake about being interviewed about the future. And they always retrospectively look like idiots. You know? Um, I mean, even very great writers, like Gabriel Garcia Marquez, while he was writing The Autumn of the Patriarch, um, gave an interview to a journalist which is published in a book of interviews. Um, uh, and the journalist says to him, well, what's your, what's your novel about? And he said, you know, I've had real difficulty working out how this book should go. He said, you, he said well, it's my dictator novel, which it is. You know, he, said, he said, everybody in Latin America ends up writing a dictator novel, and, and this is my dictator novel. And, and that's true. And, and he said, but I've just understood how the story should go. The novel is obviously the testimony of the dictator as he gives evidence in front of the tribunal that has been set up to try him. And when you read The Autumn of the Patriarch, that's got nothing to do with it. <laughs> nothing to do with it. It never occurs at any point in the story. You know? And that's the problem about talking about work in progress, you know, is that you can look like a real goof later on. <laughs> so that's as much as I can do. But please join me. This has been a fascinating evening. Please join me. Thank you. Thank you.